welcome to the ATT Cyber Threat Report for December 8, 2011. Today we have uh, joining us, we have Dave Gross. Uh, David is a senior incident response analyst and a lead of our malware analysis activities. Welcome, Dave. And uh, what do you plan to discuss today? Thanks, Brian. Uh, I'm going to discuss a uh, presentation that was made at uh, a uh, conference in Las Vegas uh, about transparent smartphone botnets. Okay, that sounds interesting, the, uh, the, the front of mobile malware. Uh, we also have joining us today Jim Clausing. Uh, Jim is our lead malware analyst. Uh, welcome, Jim. What do you plan to discuss today? Thanks, Brian. Um, today I want to talk about uh, a return of an old Apache attack and uh, update uh, some information on the SSH password guessing that we've talked about in the past. Okay, great. And uh, we have John Hogaboom join us today. John is a lead security analyst. He um, also does some tools development. Welcome, John. And uh, what do you plan to discuss today? Hey, Brian. Uh, I'm going to go over the spam trends that we're seeing still uh, with malware. Um, we'll get a little refreshed look at that. And there's actually um, a particular sample that we were getting in very aggressively being spammed. So we're going to take a closer look at that one. All right, good. It should be interesting. Uh, I'm Brian Rexford, and I'll cover the internet weather for today. And uh, let's uh, let's move into the next thing. Right, just, just before we do that, I want to remind you that uh, you can reach us at, with email uh, at cyberthreatatlist.att.com. Uh, we welcome your feedback or suggestions for the program. Uh, so uh, let's go over to Dave here. Uh, you mentioned uh, something around the uh, topic of mobile botnets. What's up? Uh, yes, um, there was a uh, conference this week, uh, uh, it's called Takedown Con, it was in Las Vegas, and um, there's a security re researcher, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce her last name, Georgia Weidman, or Weidman, uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, how it's pronounced, but anyhow, um, she had demonstrated how malware on smartphones can be used uh, as a, a botnet, you know, using a, a collective as a botnet. Um, basically, um, she has a, um, a proof of concept uh, that installs itself similar to the way Droid Dream installs itself. You know, it uh, uh, comes at, uh, attached or could be attached to uh, a, a, a legitimate app or a seemingly uh, legitimate app. And uh, basically what it does is it injects itself into the stack on the phone, and um, at that point it's able to uh, intercept the communications. And uh, the way this botnet or um, simulated botnet uh, works is uh, it communicates over SMS. So basically it will issue SMS messages unbeknownst to the user and, you know, it doesn't show up in, in the user's view there. Um, and it'll go out to uh, what would be some well-known um, other mobile phones that have uh, SMS capability. And uh, in there, uh, it would interpret the, you know, uh, the request and send something back to that phone with whatever command is uh, uh, required, uh, you know, of the botnet. Um, and not, uh, because um, there's a special uh, cookie or special uh, encoding in the uh, message, uh, it realizes that this is a message destined for it rather than the user, and so it doesn't pass it on. But if there's another kind of message, it'll pass it on to the user. So. The user will see SMS working as they think normal, but there's other SMS traffic going on um, that would be the uh, botnet communication. And of course, because this is an app on the phone and the app would uh, typically root the phone so that it had control like this, uh, it would be able to do a number of things, you know, eavesdrop on, on a number of things on the phone. So certainly significant in the sense that, uh, that to have a botnet that can collect information from a lot of phones or, or individual phones by choice uh, it's certainly is significant here. And um, I, I think another piece of it, obviously, is the fact that it's using SMS for that uh, command and control path. 
And, you know, I'm kind of wondering, I assume in this uh, particular example that the uh, command and control was using sort of a traditional, uh, what I'll call traditional uh, central command and control as opposed to uh, a sort of a P2P protocol. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the way this is is um, there's a uh, um, top-level control that um, can change often that the bots actually don't communicate with and then they communicate down to the next tier, which is uh, a number of uh, different well-known uh, numbers that are, you know, consistently there um, and so on. So that, you know, that, uh, uh, that top level, if, if need be, can be changed very frequently, you know, uh, uh, because that can be a push to, uh, to the other phones that are kind of embedded there. Um, also, they were mentioning that uh, some of the activities that this could be used for would be things like SMS spamming. Um, so, you know, there may be a, a situation for that. Um, they were also talking about uh, knowing location information from the various phones and doing some sort of uh, overload on the towers because they uh, try to broadcast a lot at the, the same time and stuff. So there are a number of these things, things that, uh, you know, they were going into um, when discussing this. And, um, you know, uh, right now it's proof of concept, but um, we've seen these things move from uh, idea to proof of concept to um, actual code. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and uh, I understand that there is actually some sample code available, or at least for parts of this. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah. So uh, I guess from our point of view, that is, as a network service provider, obviously, uh, uh, you know, folks that could be particularly or potentially a victim of this are going to be concerned about it as well. But, you know, I think that's one of the things we've sort of anticipated. We've had a lot of discussions about the, uh, the potential for botnets to use uh, SMS is their command and control. And, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm not sure how uh, well known the fact is, but, you know, SMS traverses not really an IP network, it traverses the SMS network. So, uh, which is, you know, used for call control uh, for, for traditional telephony. Now, I think there are two things about this that are actually significant. On one hand, um, Many organizations aren't really doing detailed flow analysis to be able to identify botnets. We've been doing that actually for some time now, so we are able to, you know, do some identification of botnets, certainly the significant ones, and, and uh, uh, at least track them, if not do something about that. And the SMS space, because it is using, uh, you know, basically the signaling network, uh, there are call detail records associated with that, and those are used in terms of, uh, you know, conveying information to customers about their SMS usage as well. It shows up on their bills, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, um, you know, using analysis of those call detail records, hopefully we'll be able to recognize this type of botnet if it does actually come to fruition. So on one hand, it's a new threat that we need to be concerned about. On the other hand, I don't know, what do you feel? I, I think we're uh, at least working to be well positioned to, to uh, deal with this sort of situation. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, I think that uh, we're starting to get uh, the analysis and, and the capabilities in place to, uh, to help address this sort of situation. So the main thing to watch here, I think, is the fact that, um, and I think it was one of the points of the, of the presentation, is that, you know, some of the things that can be uh, enabled on the device once the, uh, the malware is on there is, uh, is really the fundamental threat here. That is, you know, if it can uh, capture uh, user information or perhaps even monitor calls, uh, that is something to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. it, it, one thing I'd like to interject is that I'm not so sure that if I was um, writing malware for mobile devices that I would use SMS as a means for command and control only because if people do have, you know, certain SMS text messaging packages where they only have a certain amount, I'm going to lose contact with a lot of bots that I've infected. Uh, whereas in the data stream, 
you know, usually you have a data package that's going to have at least two gigs or more probably of bandwidth per month, and mm -hmm. you can at least probably maintain a lot of uh, connectivity with those bots because the messages aren't so big, uh, but they're pretty frequent uh, usually. So I don't know. That's just my opinion on that. Um, I, I, think, I think we are well positioned to monitor this type of activity and make sure it doesn't happen. I'm just not so sure that I would be interested in choosing that as a route for command and control. Not that I would be writing mobile malware anyway, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you're right, John. I think there are other uh, inhibitors in using SMS. One is that there is a, uh, you know, it's a messaging infrastructure as opposed to uh, a, a direct connection. So there is some latency in message delivery, and so certain types of botnet activities could be done uh, fairly effectively with uh, SMS, but certain other ones, you know, message size, uh, message delay, there may be some scalability issues, even with the hierarchy that was, uh, I, I, as I understand, proposed. So that is certainly a, a set of trade-offs that, um, gladly, we're not designing botnets here, but uh, things that we'd be looking for to be able to help identify and be able to thwart those botnets once they do develop. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, very good, thank you. It's, uh, it's an interesting topic, Dave. And uh, on to another interesting topic, uh, Jim, um, Apache, <laughs> what's up? Yeah, <clears throat> um, AW Stats is a, is a package uh, to do some analytics. Um, you basically, you analyze the, uh, the traffic that you've been getting to your web server, and it's a free open source uh, package that's been out there for quite a while. Most Apache installations, you, know, you get it by default. But um, and there have been some issues with it in the past. There have been some uh, some vulnerabilities in the scripts. Uh, it, it's basically a Perl script, um, and there have been some issues with it in the past. Some exploits. Uh, Hadn't really seen a whole lot of uh, probing for AW stats in quite a while until all of a sudden this week. Um, I've seen a whole bunch of probing and I'm not sure really what it is that, um, that they're trying to exploit other than um, the, the one particular parameter in the, um, to, the, to the script. Uh, they must have found some sort of a weakness in it. Um, the, the slide that I've got up here is just um, from my logs in my uh, web server at home. Um, you can see they're trying, uh, they're looking for the AW stats package in, it's often installed in different places on different installations. So. Uh, this is just a couple of uh, probes that I got yesterday morning, I guess. Um, and it, it looks like the issue is probably in this configder um, parameter. At this point, though, it just looks like they're they're testing it out. It doesn't look like they're trying to do much of anything with it. Just doing echoes and you name ID, so they're attempting to execute a few um, OS level commands, but uh, but they don't they don't appear to be actually trying to do much of anything other than see if the vulnerable uh, if they've got a vulnerable version on this particular server. Um, it's like I said, it, AW stats is something that we used to see. Um, Several years ago, uh, quite a bit of activity, and hadn't seen any. And now, all of a sudden, just in the last week or so, um, seeing quite a bit of it. So, uh, if you're running Apache, make sure you're monitoring your logs, looking for this. If you're running the AW Stats package, uh, make sure you've got got that updated to the most recent version. And if you don't need to make it available to the public, you know, control that so that uh, it's not visible to the entire world. But 
Yeah, just wanted to, to let people know to be on the lookout for it. I'm not sure exactly what they're, the bad guys are going after here, but uh, just wanted to make people aware. Uh, no doubt they're looking around so that the um, you know, potential vulnerable systems, the owners of those systems can be notified. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. I was, I was going to mention that there are a lot of um, web hosting providers out there, you know, those ones who provide, you know, for $5 a month, uh, you can register your domain here. We'll give you um, website access for a shared web hosting uh, server. A lot of those provide AWS stats uh, or they use that. That's not something that mm, traditionally you would have access to as a customer. Well, you have access to it but you wouldn't have configured it, um, the, what your web hosting provider might have. So that's something that if you are a web hosting provider, you might want to uh, take a look at as well, and maybe they already are. Um, but that's another uh, potential candidate for you using this information. Good point. Yeah, well, the other interesting thing to note from these uh, my logs here is that uh, the attacks are coming, at least these probes, and. Most of the ones that I saw in, in my logs this week had the had the same, you know, they were Firefox 8 uh, on a 64-bit OS, um, Windows 7. Don't know what that really means, but uh, it, and it, not just from this one IP, but from all the IPs that probed my web server this week, they're all running Windows 7 and Firefox 8. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, not sure what that really means, but I just thought it was interesting. All right, thanks, Jim. So uh, that's not the only probing that's going on, is it? No. Um, back in late August, we reported on uh, on some of the SSH password guessing that was going on, and we stood up a, a little uh, honeypot to, to try to capture some of the probing just to see what was going on. And so it's been a few months, and I thought it was time to go back and look at some of the data that we've collected. And um, not really sure that I can draw a whole lot of conclusions from it, but I thought some of it was interesting, so I'd share it with our audience. Uh, the first thing was the took a look at the, um, well, to, to back up for just a second, it, since, uh, since we stood up this honeypot, we've gotten, um, 66,000 probes uh, against it. It's you know, individual uh, password, username password guesses. Um, of those, uh, as you can see from the list here, most of those are uh, trying to guess the root password. That's not too surprising. Um, it's this is SSH. The vast majority of the servers that are running an SSH daemon are going to be Linux or Unix boxes. So uh, it isn't too surprising to me that the that you know by far the most guest or most probed username is root. Uh, one of the things that I did find interesting was down here the eleventh most popular username that was probed was administrator, which is you know, the privileged user on Windows boxes. Um, but, yeah, so uh, most of the time they figure they're going to be trying a Unix or a Linux box, so they try Unix or Linux standard users, root, um, admin, bin, you know, FTP admin, webmaster, um, but, it, you know, occasionally they're also trying administrator, so they're looking to see if maybe it's a Windows box, too. So, Tim, just uh, I, I thought I'd kind of interject here just briefly, if you don't mind. The um, For folks, the print here is a little bit small, so I'm not sure if uh, they'll be able to read this on the web, and certainly for the audio folks, it might be helpful to uh, put this into context. Oh, sure. Uh, here is uh, Root as being the, uh, the largest one by far, as you've mentioned. Uh, by almost two orders of magnitude. So we have about 35,000 guesses toward root, and then uh, the next one down, which is Oracle, only 660 of those, and the rest are 
in hundreds and you know in decreasing size. So we had, as you'd mentioned, Oracle, uh, Test, Admin, FTP, uh, Nagios, uh, User, Guest, Bin, FTP, User, a lot of the typical ones. MySQL shows up in here as well. Um, and some others that you might expect to be uh, sort of typical uh, FTP guest web testing. And they get a little more creative farther down. Uh, Christina is it one that I'm familiar with. One, Kat, Katrin, is that a... Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure what the deal is with those two, with Katrin and Christina, um, or, or with this Zabbix down here, which was number 30. Mm -hmm. um, My guess would be uh, the... Um, send expect sequence that was going on got confused as to whether they were at the login part or the password part, and so those were probably passwords that they were trying against one of the accounts. Oh, that's a good possibility. Well, and one of the, one of the things that occurred this, just this week, uh, there was one particularly active uh, prober who tried um, uh, about 200 different usernames, and but the the pattern that this particular one was using was the password was the same as the username. So it would by root root and Oracle Oracle and Fred Fred and you know George George, um, and it, it went down through over 200 different usernames trying this exact pattern. I wonder how successful that is. I don't know. They must have some success, or they wouldn't wouldn't keep trying it. Um, so anyway, these were the the usernames, uh, as Brian you know said: root, oracle, test, admin. Um, the next interesting uh, thing that I gathered from the logs was the which passwords they tried, and we talked a little bit about this when we first stood the honeypot up back at the end of August, the beginning of September. Um, the most popular password that was guessed was one two three four five six, and uh, you know the second most popular was password, and the third was QWERTY because that's you know those keys are right in order on the top row of the of the standard keyboard in the U.S. Um, and so the got a, a list of them up here on the screen for those who can see the webcast, for those who are just listening audio, it's, you know, 123456 was uh, 1,275 probes, password 932 times, QWERTY 526 times, and then they go down from there, you know, 1234, 123, 111111. So forth, uh, change me, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, red hat, root, root. Um, so the, one of the takeaways from, from this is, you know, you don't want to leave default passwords. You don't want to use these simple passwords. Um, but apparently there are a lot of people out there that do use these passwords or they wouldn't keep trying them all. Absolutely. So, uh, Jim, I guess another, I, I seem to remember last time you talked about this, we also saw a number of passwords that you would not have expected to be considered. You know, they certainly weren't simple uh, and uh, perhaps had been derived from, uh, you know, say, uh, experience in cracking other systems or something along those lines. Are you still seeing that sort of behavior? Uh, um, yeah, I guess I didn't uh, make a slide out of that this time. But, yeah, we, we are still seeing... Some of that, um, you know, the standard complexity rules that people recommend is that, you know, upper and lower case, a digit and a special character. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it should try to have at least, at least those. But of the 28,000 um, unique guesses, we had a total of 65,000 almost 66,000 probes. Uh, of those, um, there are 28,000 unique username password combinations. Um, and out of those, uh, 279 of them would actually qualify as a complex password. They had upper and lower case digits and special characters. And uh, some of them 
uh, are really strange. Um, some of them, I, I think, probably point to the particular tool or a group that is, is using this. Um, but some of them, I assume, are probably were gathered from uh, where they were successfully able to uh, either you know, grab passwords from someplace else or crack them in mm -hmm. the past, and so they added them to the list uh, that they used to probe. So yeah, some of them are uh, not be something I would have expected you to randomly guess. And this is a situation because it is a, uh, you know, just a honeypot that's sitting out there that, you know, it's kind of random that this particular site would get hit. Um, I think if, um, you know, if we had a sort of a purposeful or known or advertised site that was being posted, the demographics of these guesses might be a little bit different. Yeah, and that's quite possible. Um, but yeah, because this one, this particular honeypot, you know, doesn't have a name in DNS. Uh, it, it doesn't have any sort of a web server or any place out on the internet that would refer to this particular box, the only way you're going to find this one is by scanning across the IP space. Right. And we've definitely seen cases where, um, you know, the, the attackers will learn about an organization and use that in terms of, you know, making maybe smarter guesses on passwords, you know, including organization name or the user, the person's name that they might be targeting, that sort of thing, as uh, well as perhaps having already stolen, you know, user ID and passwords from an organization and are seeing if that particular user had access to a particular system that's associated with that organization. So, um, you know, you're, even the random isn't all that random. Yep, yep. Um, just a couple more uh, things that I, wanted to highlight from looking at the at the logs. Um, you know, we, we get the probes from all over the place. Um, had you know, almost 10,000 of them come from this one particular IP, but we get them from lots of other places. Um, what, what I found kind of interesting was that I went and I looked at um, where these IPs are located, you know, geolocated, and 38% of the uh, probes uh, were coming from China, 18% were coming from the US, 8% you know, from Australia, and we had Canada, Netherlands, Korea, Russia, France, Brazil, Nigeria made up the top 10, um, and then 12% you know, were scattered from other places, we had it. We got probes from a total of 54 different countries mm -hmm. um, since we set this up. So, one thing I'd like to interject is that um, uh, related to running an SSH server, uh, this is a honeypot. But if you are, if you do have one exposed to the internet, try to filter it. We always say that so that only people that you want to be able to reach it can get to it. Um, but additionally, something that I don't mention very much is. Uh, I would recommend that you lock down root. Uh, a lot of default Linux distributions don't lock down root so that you can't remotely log in as it. Uh, Ubuntu is one that does by default, um, but you can control that. I think through the SSHD config or one of the SSH config files, you can set it so that you cannot log in remotely as root. Uh, we see that that's the most guessed, uh, well, it's the most often used login ID that they're trying to get in because it gives them administrative access. Um, and it, even if you lock it out, you can still log in under your regular ID, then SU or SU do to your to uh, root to do whatever administrative tasks you need. So uh, something to consider if you do have a uh, server that's got SSH exposed to the internet. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it, the permit root login should be set to no in the SSHD config. Um, the other thing that you know, the way I've got my home server set up is that I don't allow password logins into my home system. You have to use the uh, the keys, the public key uh, right. login. That takes a little more effort. You've got to have that set up in advance and you've got to have the um, authorized keys file set up on the server. 
but that way they can guess all the passwords they want. They're never going to get into my home server. So. That's a little more work in advance, but actually can be quite a bit easier once you've got it set up, right? Absolutely. Yep. All right, very good. Thank you, Jim. Anyway, yeah, that, so that was just, it had been a few months since we had looked at it, so I thought it was worth taking another quick look at, at what we found there. Good. All right, thank you, Jim. And uh, John, I guess uh, the next topic we're going to talk about here is uh, spam hasn't stopped yet? No, it hasn't stopped. It continues. There's not much new story to tell here. Um, we're seeing a lot of the same stuff we've seen. Uh, there's one notable um, new uh, development that we're going to cover in a second here. Uh, but just to give a, a quick overview, uh, this past week, past seven days, we analyzed about 1.2 million spams. It's a little, little bit uh, more than we did the previous week. I don't know if that's because uh, that was over the Thanksgiving was kind of included in the previous one that we had analyzed, hmm. and now we're seeing more. But in any event, uh, about 1.2 million. Uh, the majority of them, we can't really tell. They look like just your kind of generic spam, which we've covered before. Um, regular advertising types of spam or, you know, make money from home, those kinds of things. Not necessarily malware um, inside, but trying to get your business in some way. Um, uh, we, we saw about uh, 3,594 that were blocked, spams that were blocked, which had malicious attachments, confirmed malicious, and they were removed before they were ever delivered to the customer. And then there was about, uh, two, well, I shouldn't say the customer, but to our spam probe accounts. Um, and then there were about 2,348 that actually made it through uh, with the attachment intact uh, to the mailbox. Uh, there was uh, all told 42,000 um, uh, spam emails that had attachments in general, and uh, there were only 6,779 unique attachments by their MD5 checksums. Uh, and that's out of 125, or I'm sorry, 1.2 million spams. There's only about 6,800 are about unique attachments in any of those uh, emails. Uh, when we look at the distribution, uh, there was a bump up in the RTF space here, uh, rich text format um, attachments. I think I took a look at that, and it was those 419 scams where they're sending you, saying you want to, you know, we have money in an account for you in some foreign country, and just fill out the form and send it to us, and it's in a, a rich text format file for whatever reason. I didn't see that there was anything malicious in there other than just being an attachment that had, you know, some form to fill out. Uh, same thing with the doc ones. Uh, zips uh, could be have multiple types of content in there. Uh, PDF docx, and then there were EXEs. Those EXEs are always troubling to me when we see that many. Um, almost 1,900 of the uh, attachments were uh, EXEs. Um, so we're going to go take a look at that. And then there's the, the, all the others that we see, you know, a lot of the Microsoft Office formats, um, Excel, PowerPoint, et cetera. Um, there are some smaller ones, some VBS ones here, batch files. Those are very suspicious. SCR is a script uh, of some sort probably. Um, I've seen these .pif ones as well, and they usually end up being an executable, um, but for whatever reason they have a .pif extension. Moving along. Uh, Jen, I just wanted to sort of interject here just uh, briefly as a reminder. I, I think you sort of mentioned this and I was uh, clarify that all of this analysis is based on uh, email that's been sent to email accounts that have no legitimate user. And so this is a case where, uh, you know, you corrected yourself when you mentioned customer. This is a case where we know that all of these are spam. Nobody's soliciting email here. There's nobody exchanging with these uh, on these accounts. But, um, it, you know, a portion of these uh, are, are apparently able to uh, squeak past the, uh, the scanning rules. That's right. Right. And also, you know, for um, uh, corporations and stuff, they could uh, block certain attachments if they have the capability. I mean, um, there shouldn't be a reason why you need an EXE coming from an external source to, you know, one of your employees. Um, if you do need to send some sort of uh, uh, binary file like that, it should be wrapped in something so that it can't just be uh, executed and invoked uh, accidentally. Yeah, very good. Good point, Dave. Thanks. Yep. Okay, done. <laughs> um, 
So in the general category here, I'm going to try to move through a little quickly. Not much new story to tell here. We talked about some of these last week. There is some, some minor holiday themes going on here, um, mostly just spam advertisements. This re semicolon A one is another one that is, uh, you know, make money from home. We looked at that last week as well. Uh, one that we're going to talk about in a little more detail is this one that actually had a count of about 4,000 or so, USPS delivery failure notification. That actually is malware. And that's a very high number. Normally, if you remember some previous shows, we don't normally see that many uh, spams uh, related to malware in one kind of topic. Um, mm -hmm. We might see 4,000 all told, you know, for the entire week. But in this case, we saw 4,000 in one particular uh, type of spam that was one particular type of malware as well. So we're going to take a closer look at that. In general, same kind of topics we usually see, though. Um, uh, most of these probably fairly benign, but your general spam. So the ones that were blocked, and uh, here we go, is this USPS delivery failure notification. We got bombarded over the past few days with this. This is downloaded Ramadan. Uh, about 3,000 or so of these came in uh, to the various spam probe accounts. And uh, we're going to take a closer look at this sample um, in a second. Uh, the next category is Trojan Smaller, which we've talked about before. Um, this one is spamming very similar topics, and you can get a little confused because we do have a big uh, grouping of USPS ones as well. And I've said this before, I uh, reiterate, these are purporting to be from the United States Postal Service or FedEx. They are not. Um, though these emails are not from those organizations. They're pretending to be. Um, but you, you'll see here in smaller, we have uh, some USPS. We have some uh, InDesign Creative Suite 4, which is the Photoshop is included in that from Adobe. It uh, looks like some kind of fake license key, probably trying to coerce somebody into opening something so they can get a free copy of expensive software. Um, in the Trojan ZBot space, they're also doing some stuff with Adobe Acrobat. Um, there was another group I noticed that looks like a different sample set. Um, I should mention ZBot Zeus, which we've talked about before, is a toolkit that you can buy um, or obtain and uh, build your own, you know, binary. So there's more than one person kind of running this botnet. So we kind of lump them all under Trojan ZBot, um, but in general, it's probably multiple different people um, running their own spam campaigns with different subject types. Uh, one that we've seen uh, recently this week is American Airlines order um, with the subject of American Airlines uh, uh, in, the, in the subject line. Uh, DHL uh, is a typical one we've seen. FedEx, again, uh, UPS tracking. Uh, we also saw another new one here that I hadn't seen before for information, uh, important account information from Verizon Wireless, uh, purporting to be, again, from Verizon Wireless, although it's not. Uh, this has a ZBOP payload in it. Um, most of these ones have just an EXE dumped in there or a zip file with an EXE inside, so they're not trying to be very sneaky at all. Hmm. Um, rounding out the list, MyTob. Talked about MyTob before. These are primarily targeting att.net accounts. Um, they're included in here, but those are where a lot of our spam probe accounts are, so that's why we're seeing a bunch of these in here. This MyTob campaign going on kind of targeting uh, people who have att.net accounts, saying that your password's expired or it's been reset. Click on this to, you know, regain access to your account, and that would infect you with MyTob. Uh, and Akanta, which I can't say very well, we talked about that one as well. This is a little campaign, not many of them, uh, inviting you to join uh, Twitter or LinkedIn with a friend of yours, uh, purporting to be a friend of yours. And uh, NetSky, uh, I didn't take a look at this one. We only got one NetSky sample um, with a subject of stolen document. Um, it sounds kind of interesting, but I didn't get a chance to look at it in detail. Um, so in terms of the, and these were all detected and blocked before they were ever delivered to the email box, the ones we just talked about. So if you look at the pie chart here, Dramadon was by far the leader, uh, probably accounting for 80% at least of all of the, the spams with malicious attachments that were blocked. Uh, Smaller was the next, and ZBot, and then some of the other ones are very thin slivers in the pie chart here. Uh, but those were the ones that we saw most heavily um, spammed out this past week. Uh, when we look at the ones that the spams with unblocked suspicious malicious attachments, 
Uh, these means that made it all the way through, got delivered to the mailbox with the attachment intact of a malicious payload. When we actually go back after the fact and we look at it, you'll notice way up at top here, Dramadon is uh, 1,100 of them. It's actually the same one. We talked about this before. Probably they started blitzing the email boxes with this downloader Dramadon sample. Uh, it took a little while for the antivirus vendors to catch up and create a signature for it. And at some point during that day, they were able to. Um, and then those 3,000 or so that we saw in the previous page uh, were blocked and removed. Uh, so these are probably ones that slipped through prior to detection uh, being created for them in the antivirus that's built into the, the, um, the, the spam um, delivery. Uh, Zbot, we see lots of Zbots, which is not unusual, smaller, uh, nothing really new in here. Uh, these are all very topics that we've seen already. Um, again, they're probably similar situations where it just took a little while for the AV vendors to catch up and create a signature so that we could block it before and remove it from the email before it was delivered. So, John, on those two lines, um, what is the difference between those? Is the signature different for these two, or how? What? Yes, I guess I should have pointed that out. They really, uh, it, what it is, is it's a different uh, sample, and I didn't. Um, I removed the MD5 checksums from this just because this report got a little too busy. Look, it's probably hard for anybody who is actually reading this on. Uh, are watching this uh, to read these, this text. But in any event, I had to remove the MD5 checksums, but they were different. Uh, even though they had the same file attachment, same subject, same message inside the body, the file itself was slightly changed. Right. I think I kind of, uh, or at least presumed that, and I thought it would be useful to point out, that's one of the reasons that some of these leak through before they, they get picked up by the antivirus and then blocked is that, um, you know, even though they may look the same in terms of subject line, in terms of the, uh, the fact that there's an executable attachment, uh, ultimately the signature of the executable itself is different, and uh, it it's, uh, makes it a more challenging environment for, the, uh, for any virus uh, uh, checking to, uh, to be successful. Yep. Uh, that's a good point, so thank you for clarifying that. Um, some of the other ones in here, Again, not much uh, to really be said. There are a few way down the list that we did not see many of that actually intrigued me, but I didn't get a chance to look at them because I wanted to look at the one that was very heavily spanned, that Dramadon sample. So we'll take a look at that. Um, but some of these other ones um, had a subject line of grasping mind is important. I didn't actually look at that email. Sounds a little intriguing. It has an executable attachment in there. I suspect it's uh, something. I believe I tried to cross-reference the MB5 sum up on virus total, and it was um, not. It was run through there, but not well detected with enough of a name that I was actually able to write anything down. So, probably warrants further investigation. Um, just see. and then even further down, we've got a few here or there with some other samples, smaller Zbot, uh, MyTobs that made it through, uh, but nothing. Yeah, nothing uh, surprising here on this list based on what we've already talked about. So what I did want to cover real quickly, uh, we're not going to go in a lot of depth, but this one Dramadon, downloader Dramadon spam sample that was sent out, it was really aggressively spammed um, over the past week here, most notably the past few days. Um, Dramadon is a, a Trojan downloader. It's not really it's not really the, the malware itself. It's more uh, a facilitator to download additional malware. It's a small little binary. They wrap it in, give it some instructions to go download additional malware that's actually going to be doing the real dirty work infection, infection in your machine. It's not so much um, uh, – it's basically that's it. It's a downloader. In any event, what we're seeing here is this UPS delivery failure notification uh, sent out. It's basically indicating uh, – I have a sample of it on the screen here – uh, that the United States Postal Service, and this is not from them again, it's pretending to be from the USPS, uh, saying that we're unable to deliver a package, uh, please print out the shipment label that is attached as a, a zip and collect your package at our office. Again, this is a timely thing. A lot of people are using uh, postal services this time of year, so they might be getting more traction right now, and that might be why they're also uh, sending out so many of them, because they might be getting a better take rate uh, with people being tricked into this, uh, this particular type of campaign. 
If you actually uh, open this zip file and uh, execute what's inside, it's just an executable. When it actually drops down onto the desktop, if you were to do that, not that you had to, it looks like a PDF. It has an icon that makes it look like a PDF document, but it's really not. It's an executable. Um, when we run it through VirusTotal, uh, it's somewhat poorly detected. Uh, 13 of 40 or so antivirus vendors picked it up as of this morning, and um, uh, most of them are picking up as a fake antivirus, um, or also known as um, Gamaru, uh, Cryptor, or fake AV, depending on what vendor you're looking at, um, AV vendor. Uh, I did mention in here it does a uh, when you when you execute this USPS report executable that's in the email. It uh, does a quick post to uh, this URL here, this h-t-o-b-e-r-t-u-r.ru uh, with an encoded parameter. That's probably some kind of check-in. Not quite sure what they're doing there. It only does it once. And then it fetches an additional payload uh, from another site uh, with the name lq.exe. That's actually the fake AV um, payload itself. Um, it is virtual machine debugger aware, so I wasn't able to actually analyze this in a virtual machine. Uh, it just stopped right there as soon as you try. Um, but I was able to run it in a real machine, get a little bit more information about it. So it, it, what it does, it goes, downloads additional fake AV malware, downloads um, something that kind of gets detected as a DNS changer as well, which we've talked about DNS changers. So it downloads a few additional components, but uh, long story short, it's a fake antivirus. Um, so uh, if you were to run this, infect your machine, you would probably get an icon at the bottom of your system tray nagging you that you have infections, and it'll look like a very legitimate-looking piece of antivirus, uh, but it's probably got some bogus name, and it's going to try to coerce you into uh, paying them, whatever, $29.95 for a year subscription to do a fake piece of antivirus software. And it's one of those pay-per-install types of uh, uh, operations where, you know, they're infecting you with not real software, uh, but charging your credit card for it. So which credit card did you use, John? <laughs> I actually did not uh, go through the entire process. Sure. So. Uh, is that covered, Jen? Yeah, that's all I have. Okay, that's very good. I think, um, you know, one of the things you mentioned, this one is virtual machine uh, slash debugger aware. Um, I find that actually to be kind of uh, an intriguing uh, uh, concept in that, you know, we've been aware of this for a while, have been dealing with it in malware analysis, but as we uh, migrate more toward cloud computing, and, you know, one of the uh, things that's being looked at is the notion of, a, you know, a cloud-based desktop and uh, having a very thin client that uh, perhaps a tablet or something that you're using to uh, access that uh, cloud-based de desktop. So uh, that puts the, uh, the malware creators in sort of a quandary in the sense that they have to decide whether they want to be able to work in a cloud environment or whether they're really, uh, you know, more focused toward evading the, uh, the honeypot or the uh, malware analysis environment. Right. Yeah. I also wanted to point out uh, this is a really good example that something that sounds as innocuous as a downloader can really be malicious because uh, you have no idea what other payload uh, can come down after this gets onto your machine. So just, you know, if, if you get infected with the downloader, you say, oh, okay, it can, you know, bring some other stuff onto the machine. But, you know, that's a real big uh, gaping hole, real big danger. Absolutely. This is a case where uh, it appeared to be one thing, but it did check into somewhere, which su suggests perhaps um, uh, there may be other payloads that could come at a later time or um, other activities. So you're absolutely right. This is just uh, sort of scratching the surface of the, of the malware that could be introduced to a machine that gets infected this way. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. And uh, so let's go ahead and move on to the final segment of our report for today, which is the uh, Internet weather activity. Uh, we like to call it that. It's really sort of a historical view, but hopefully gives some insight into what will be going on uh, in the next uh, week or so. Uh, we have uh, a couple of repeats here, sort of uh, something that's coming back from a historical point of view as well. First one, uh, we've been reporting on this for several weeks now. It's uh, scanning activity on port 161 UDP. That's uh, SNMP. We'll take a look at the activity that's going on there. 
uh, it has, for the first time, raised itself to the top of the list. Uh, we have some cup, a couple of, well, a couple few other things here. Uh, one that uh, I think we reported on the past, 6257, we'll take a look at that. Uh, a resurgence of scanning activity on port 23, TCP, that's Telnet. Um, that one has a little bit of a new twist to it. Uh, it has some similarities to what we'd reported on in past weeks uh, worth taking a look at. Uh, we have a couple that are related, related in the sense that it's actually the same source that is scanning these two ports, port 1002 as well as port 1003. We'll take a look at that one. And um, another one that's sort of spiky, uh, TCP port 7778. And uh, we'll take a quick look at that. And then also uh, port 445. Uh, nothing really significant to report here other than there are some what I'll call localized um, changes in the, uh, the demographics that are kicking off some, uh, you know, uh, an anomalies in our detection activity here. So we'll just take a look at that as well. There's some P2P activity, looks to be innocuous. Um, it's growing in nature, but this is the season of new games releases and the, uh, and the shopping season, so uh, that we kind of expect to see. And then last but not least, there's some scanning activity in port 5631. We'll take a look at that. So uh, we won't draw this out too far. Uh, first one, uh, we had, been, as I said, been reporting on activity on uh, port 161 UDP. That's a simple network management protocol. Uh, a couple of subtle differences here. One is that as of the last report, that was on December 1st, uh, we were seeing, uh, we had seen some fairly aggressive scanning activity uh, that had stopped for a short period of time, and then we saw another sort of resurgence of that sort of activity. So uh, there still seems to be some interest here. It seems to be getting, uh, um, you know, continuing to be so somewhat aggressive, although we have uh, seen a lull period of the last several days. Uh, the majority of probes, and I'm mostly speaking of the ones that occurred on, uh, on December 3rd here, the majority of those probes actually came from a single U.S.-based source. And uh, that's sort of one of the characteristics that we've uh, found about this is that, generally speaking, we've seen one or a couple or a few sources doing this scanning activity throughout as we've been reporting this since the beginning of November. And uh, in addition to that, uh, each time it seems to be a different address. Now, in this particular case, what we're seeing is that uh, that source is actually, um, I believe, hosted in a... Um, I, actually, I, I shouldn't conjecture about that. I was thinking maybe it was hosted in a, uh, in a hosting facility that may have been uh, sort of a purchase server. Uh, I'd have to double check that to be sure, but I think that, in fact, may be true. And uh, the other thing that we have seen uh, on and off, and this is just very recently, is some uh, you know, short periods of multi-packet probes. So these actually could be uh, cases where they found a, an SNMP server uh, that is responding, and they've queried it further for uh, for feedback. Um, we haven't really investigated that to a lot of detail, but you know the the assumption is that this probing is going on to find uh, accessible SNMP servers that are willing to respond and provide information about uh, the devices that are that are running those servers. So, uh, as always, uh, you don't really want SNMP exposed to the internet. It's not a particularly secure protocol, and that's an understatement. Um, next item is uh, port 6257. We've reported on this, and that's what, this is a UDP activity, 6257 UDP. Um, this is associated with WinMX. That's a, uh, uh, basically a P2P file sharing port. As I reported in the past, uh, and you can see I'm showing actually 60 days of activity. There was some activity in the past. Uh, the difference here is we're seeing more activity and more recently in the last week or so. Um, I, I, I'm reluctant to call this aggressive because it is not that significant number of participants in it. It is not actually that significant number of flows. Uh, it may, in fact, be very legitimate. The, uh, the sources that are participating here are weighted toward, that is, there are diverse countries involved, but uh, Mostly, it seems in Germany, U.S., Italy, France, and Japan. So, um, you know, some particip other participating um, participants from other countries, only in the terms of hundreds of participants. So, not a significant issue, but uh, it does show up as an anomaly because it is such a uh, 
a significant difference in the activity of what we're used to seeing. Uh, the next item, this is a, a revisit to Port 23, Telnet. And uh, we had reported, been reporting some time back a uh, significant amount of activity. The graph I'm showing here is a little bit different. I'm, I usually am reluctant to use this sort of graph because it is uh, a little more, uh, less intuitive to uh, take a look at. But in this case, it, it illustrates the point significantly more. So uh, when we were reporting on this back in the July timeframe, there was actually a, what I would describe as a significant increase in the number of sources that were doing scanning activity. And we uh, were able to associate that most of those sources uh, at some times up around in the tens of thousands were um, associated with all basically centralized in a, uh, uh, a provider in Korea. And that was the most significant observation. That is, we did not see a significant change in the number of probes on the network. That is, these probes were going sort of low and slow. And uh, clearly what we're seeing here, and we're looking at 180 days here, so where I was pointing up over here on the left, this is way back in July. What we're seeing in just the last few days or so is uh, a significant increase in the number of probes that are taking place. That's the, uh, the red line that's shown on this gra graph. So uh, based on what we had typically seen as, uh, as our baseline, uh, we've seen about a 135-fold increase in the number of probes. And uh, there's been an increase in the number of sources doing that probes, but only about a three-fold increase in the number of sources. So uh, that's sort of a complex explanation here, but basically what that's saying is that uh, whoever's doing this scanning, they still have basically a botnet uh, that is significantly reduced in strength doing this scanning, and they've gotten a lot more aggressive about doing that scanning activity. And uh, my presumption here is that this is uh, doing some sort of a password guessing attack. I haven't verified that. But uh, certainly, again, this is a case where you really don't want to be exposing Telnet to the Internet anyway. Uh, but if you do, uh, make sure you have good passwords on there. Uh, the next item, uh, actually the next two items as I mentioned earlier, this port 1002 TCP and port 1003 TCP, uh, are both being probed uh, by the same source address. It's actually a single source. And uh, one of these ports does have a service associated with it that is at least it's registered to a particular service. It's called uh, Microsoft Site Server Internet Locator Service. Um, I have, I'll be honest, I don't know what that is. Uh, there was actually a note associated with this that said something about being re um, associated with net meeting. And, um, I don't know that that actually this scanning is is actually related to that because it is also scanning on port 1003, which does not have a registered service associated with it. So uh, it's uh, it's sort of up in the air. One of the things that I did notice though is that some of these probes do appear to be getting responses. That is, they're making uh, TCP connections in some of these cases. So uh, it is something that certainly if you know that you're running services on either of these ports, uh, pay attention to that. Uh, I can't say for certain what they're actually going after. But in terms of activity, what we did see is what I just call is uh, moderate to low-level scanning activity. This is in the millions of probes per hour. Um, first was the uh, port, I think this is one, yeah, this is 1002 that we saw first. And more recently and continuing, we're seeing probing activity on port 1003. And uh, next we have uh, probing activity uh, in port 7778. Uh, it's registered to Enterwise. It's actually a uh, service that was um, uh, is offered by at and It's a uh, web sharing service. In fact, we're using it as part of the session. But it actually is used by some other applications as well. There is a, uh, actually a Windows vulnerability um, associated with this port back in 2004. Uh, there's, it's also a... Uh, sort of a default interface for Oracle web, uh, Oracle database, uh, their web interface. And uh, only a handful of sources are doing the probing, uh, some of them in China, some are actually a, uh, a US-based cloud service provider. That is, uh, they provide, um, you know, uh, servers and um, for, you know, you can purchase with a credit card, so to speak. So uh, I wouldn't consider that to be a strong indication of actually who's behind it per se, but uh, apparently somebody is interested in 
probing on this port. Um, the activity is not particularly aggressive. It's very spiky in nature. It's been going on for uh, several weeks now, um, but it does uh, show up on our list, so I thought it would be worth uh, at least reporting that to you. And uh, port 445 is a little bit different in the sense that we always see a ton of scanning activity on port 445. The one thing that uh, I wanted to point out, I've reported this a little bit in the past, is that there are some uh, changes in activity that we've seen. Uh, what we're actually looking at on this graph is this number of sources that are scanning on a given hour, and um, it's measured in thousands. So we always see on the order of tens of thousands of sources scanning on port 445. A lot of it is uh, latent, you know, conflict or worm infections that still exist. Uh, some of it is botnets that have uh, mimicked the exploits associated with that, so they're doing their own scanning. And uh, we've seen some on and off activity. Uh, it's, uh, it's been shown, this is back in October. I think I'm showing about 60 days worth of activity here. Uh, we saw a relatively recent increase. This was actually near the beginning of November, so uh, recent is a sort of a relative term. And we're also seeing some changes uh, more localized on the network. So whether that's uh, scanning particular ranges of addresses or whether it's uh, you know, increases in the number of sources that they're doing that scanning, uh, we are seeing some changes along those lines. So that's the reason it shows up as an anomaly. Um, I'm not sure there's anything other, other that can be done. Port 445 should not be exposed to the Internet. In fact, it's kind of, uh, it needs to be done very uh, carefully, even within an enterprise, because of the number of infections that exploit that. Uh, next one is we've seen some scanning activity in 34, 334 UDP, and this looks like, uh, near as I can tell, some legitimate P2P activity. I'm guessing that it's associated with gaming activity. Um, the, uh, the participants are presume, uh, excuse me, they're uh, predominantly uh, consumer broadband uh, uh, addresses, and the actual application is unknown, but the, there's clearly been sort of an upward trend in activity over the last 30 days or, or so, and uh, there seems to be a sort of a, you know, sort of a strong diurnal pattern perhaps uh, associated with folks that are uh, joining in gaming and, and exiting that. That's conjecture on my part, but uh, it's, uh, it's a reasonable conclusion. Uh, next one, scanning probes on 5631. Uh, we've seen this in the past. So there have been some spikes that have showed up in the last month or so. Uh, this port is associated with PC Anywhere, and the probes are from a single source in the United States. Um, this, again, is a uh, cloud or host, uh, hosting or a cloud provider. Basically, again, you can buy the server with a credit card. So uh, not a... a you know, that, where that address is would not be a strong indication of the actor here, uh, but pro sort of supports the idea that uh, perhaps it is for malicious purposes. Uh, it's been on and off, and, um, you know, clearly PC Anywhere, that's a remote access tool. Uh, we've talked many times about RDP and um, other remote access uh, ports that are, VNC being another one that are continuously probed looking for uh, weak passwords to be able to perhaps get into an enterprise uh, or a private network uh, through one of, these, uh, one of these services. So clearly something to pay attention to. And then looking at our uh, sort of our general activity, ongoing activity, everything else is based on uh, having detected anomalies, changes in the activity. Uh, we see, again, the normal things, uh, growth in port 23 or resurgence of port 23 scanning activity had shown up. And this is in terms of the number of probes that we've uh, detected on the network. I had mentioned RDP just a minute ago. RDP is certainly being probed. Uh, Jim talked in, this in depth about uh, uh, probing activities or password guessing attacks on port 22 SSH. Um, and then there are also the, uh, the typical attacks against uh, databases that are taking place, 1434, and, which is uh, Microsoft SQL database, and 3306, which is MySQL. Oh, and then uh, we also, on 1433, which is also the uh, Microsoft SQL, and then we've uh, also talked about 445. Same uh, situation in terms of this number of sources that are doing that probing. Uh, you know, this would be an association with botnets. Uh, we talked about the botnet relationship on port 23 again, and um, all these others are pretty much standard. 
not a not lot of new information, so I don't see a need to burden you with that too much more. So with that, uh, I'll ask and see if the group here has any final comments. Actually, I have one comment about your initial slide there with SNMP um, and that people should be wary if they are running it and they might want to shut it down or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of occasion where you might have a particular type of network device, particularly if you have a DSL modem that's like provided by your ISP or vendor um, that has SNMP enabled uh, a lot of times with the public default community name. Uh, so someone, whoever's behind this activity, could very easily be going around just doing an SNMP probe to get the system description name off and find out what type of device that is which later on they might use for uh, doing more specific targeting of certain devices. Um, but you might not even be aware that certain devices, particularly embedded devices like that, not necessarily your, your computer or your PC or your Linux server, but uh, routers and other types of DSL modems, cable modems, et cetera, that provide exterior gateway services on your network might have SNMP enabled and you might not even be aware. Point, John, and, and you know, quite frankly, we have not verified that this is malicious activity. But the fact that each time we see a surge in activity is coming from a different address is very suggestive of that fact. Now, it could be some type of research activity of some sort or a legitimate, you know, sort of uh, uh, thing. Uh, the other sort of thing that's suspicious in my mind is the fact that we are seeing sort of these multi-packet probes that suggest that there's an in-depth query going on against particular targets. So. Uh, uh, your point is, uh, is well taken. You may have some things that are exposed on the Internet side that you don't know about that um, you at least want to be sensitive to that in terms of what it might be able to discover about your network. Right. All right, very good. Thank you, John. And uh, with that, uh, I want a, a final reminder, if you have questions or comments or suggestions, contact us at cyberthreat at list.att.com. Uh, you can also get this uh, program. It's on the AT&T Tech Channel. That's techchannel.att.com. Just look for the Cyber Threat Report. Uh, but you can also get it as an uh, audio podcast from iTunes, or you can get it from YouTube. Uh, just search for the AT&T Cyber Threat Report. Uh, we have reports going throughout 2011, so you may be interested in some of the uh, older reports as well. And uh, I want to thank Jim, John, and Dave for joining us today. Thank you for your input, and uh, on behalf of all of us here, uh, keep your network safe.